Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Politics and Prose. I'm Brad Graham. I'm the co-owner of the bookstore, along with my wife, Alyssa Muscatine. And uh, we're delighted to be um, hosting uh, Professor Richard uh, Prum, uh, who's uh, here to talk about his new book, uh, Performance All the Way Down, Genes, Development, and Sexual Difference. Uh, Rick's an, an evolutionary uh, ornithologist uh, who's on the faculty at Yale, where he's also the head curator of vertebrate zoology at the Peabody Museum of Natural History. Uh, his interest uh, in birds dates back to, um, to his childhood when uh, shortly before his 10th birthday, I, I hope this is a true story, Rick, uh, he discovered a bird guide, and this is the part I love, at a bookstore. Um, he got very excited, so for his birthday, his mom uh, bought him the book, The Golden Field Guide to Birds of North America. Uh, and the next thing you know, he's the bird guy at Yale. Um, in his work on bird development and behavior, uh, Rick has explored a range of topics, among them uh, uh, avian uh, phylogeny, color in birds, feather development, and the nature of mate selection. Uh, one of his major findings came in the study of feathers uh, when he arrived at what proved to be a, a breakthrough theory uh, tying uh, the origin of feathers to non-avian dinosaurs. A previous adaptationist thinking had argued that feathers had evolved from uh, reptile scales. Rick, Rick approaches ornithology as if it were an interdisciplinary program, drawing on a wide spectrum of disciplines, genetics, uh, anatomy, developmental, biology, chemistry, physics, game theory, aesthetics. Uh, he describes the process as making connections between fields not formally thought to be interrelated. Um, my younger son uh, took one of Rick's uh, courses uh, a few years ago. So I asked him how it went. He said, I signed up for an ornithology class and ended up learning a lot about dinosaurs and sex. <laughs> so <laughs> Rick's previous book, uh, which, which came out uh, six years ago, The Evolution of Beauty, uh, was fascinating and provocative. Uh, and by the way, it made the New York Times uh, list of uh, top 10 books in 2017 and was a finalist for the Pulitzer. Uh, in it, uh, Rick took issue with the adaptationist theory of evolution by natural selection uh, and argued instead for another uh, Darwin theory, uh, though a long neglected one, a theory of sexual selection in which the act of choosing a mate for purely aesthetic reasons, uh, for the mere pleasure of it, uh, provides an independent engine of evolutionary change. Rick's new book also is fascinating and, and, pro and provocative. Uh, it reflects an interest that Rick has developed over the years in f uh, feminist science studies and, and queer th theory, uh, which looks at um, the uh, variation, uh, uh, the differences in people, and, 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 and tries to explain it. Um, essentially, the book challenges the conventional notion of gender as binary, uh, as, as male or female, and argues for new ways to view sex, gender, and diversity in uh, human bodies. Uh, that's all I'm going to say about it, because Rick can explain it uh, much better. Uh, but I will say that if you're wondering uh, how someone who has spent his career on issues of avian biology and evolution has ended up writing about uh, human gender and sex, especially someone who, as he says about himself, is pale, male, and Yale, uh, then I suggest you at least read the prologue of his book where he tells you how he got to this point. And, uh, and, 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 and I think then you'll really be excited about reading the rest of the book. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Richard Prum. Great. Uh, thank you very much uh, to Brad and to Alyssa uh, for uh, organizing the event, and, uh, and thank you all for coming. It's a real pleasure to speak to you and to so many faces that I know as well. This is old home week. Um, so uh, how did uh, I, you know, pale male Yale ornithologist, get into writing this book? Well, uh, the, you know, I, I, as, as Brad mentioned, I've been 
treating ornithology as if it was avian area studies for a long time. And, and that means uh, going to wherever the tools uh, that you can acquire necessary for understanding birds better uh, uh, and, and deploying them, bringing them in. In each of these fields, I try to um, dip down into this topic and uh, knowing that uh, acquire whatever tools you can you you, you can get, and then uh, and then and then uh, return to ornithology, uh, knowing that uh, you can't become them, and so you've got to somehow benefit from what they know. Uh, in this case, uh, at the evolution of beauty, I propose that uh, that uh, that duck sex, right, which involves a lot of uh, unfortunate, uh, you know, uh, 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 sexual coercive and violent uh, activities. Um, um, led us to the discovery that freedom of choice matters to animals, right? And what that means is that, that there's, um, in some sense, what I described as a feminist discovery in the sciences, right? And, and so I was, uh, that, that statement, which I felt so uh, confident in my guts was true, uh, led me afterwards to go, you know, I really ought to be supporting that better. And the way I decided to support that better was to pursue in areas outside of, uh, of, of ornithology uh, a better support. And where that, that meant reading in uh, feminist science studies, uh, queer theory, and other critiques of the sciences to try to find out what a feminist science would look like. Right? And of course, lots of people have been working that on, on that in a long way. I first found that literature to be pretty alienating. Right? People were, in, in, in general, uh, sort of pissed off. Uh, and, uh, and, and I can uh, appreciate that because sometimes I am too in the sciences, right? But what I f ultimately found was a deep uh, uh, set of topics that were extremely relevant to biology. And this got exciting. I thought at first initially that I would find a kind of rapprochement, a, a, a set of languages that will allow us to, 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 to communicate in a common uh, way. And what I discovered to my surprise was that queer theory had actually transformed the way I was thinking about biology. That in fact, it was much deeper than merely a set of, of, uh, of ideas or a set of vocabularies that we could use for a common conversation. Indeed, that biology, as I proposed in the book, needs queer theory to get the body right. And that there is something that scientists can learn about the sciences from people who are not scientists. Right? And all of those things are kind of uh, a set of, a set of radical statements. Now, I'm not going to try to support all that with uh, the uh, with, uh, independent book, but just give you an introduction to the argument today. Um, um, so how do we connect uh, genetics, development, evolution, the material body to, 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 to queer theory? Well, I'm going to try to do it by the quickest route I can. And this is actually something uh, established since the book. I sort of think, like, hmm, I could have done it that way in the book, but it, uh, a new set of thoughts. We're uh, often used to thinking of the um, material uh, or of the, of, the, of the genome as a blueprint, right? Uh, I've actually since found out the first use of the word uh, blueprint in genomics or in genetics goes back to the 1950s. And then just a few months ago when the NIH announced its new pan genome, a, a human genome version that takes into account maximum uh, diversity in, in, in human genetics, uh, the NIH used a uh, blueprint in its description. So this spans the entire history of our study of DNA. And yet if we look at the idea of a body as, or the genome as a blueprint, and what that implies about what the, our bodies are, what it really says is that the body is a kind of representation of a plan, an evolved plan or an algorithm encoded in the genome, right? And this is a common uh, way we engage and, and think about that. Well, if we think about that, that means the body is a representation of the prior plan. Um, we recognize that the blueprint is actually one of a numerous, a whole rich set of um, linguistic analogies for, the, for genetics, right? And so um, if we can then go to some language philosophy, what kind of inference or what kind of supposition is the idea of a blueprint? Well, if the genome is a blueprint, then the body is a representation, a material representation of the plan, 
right? And that uh, going to philosophy of language as a kind of representational speech act. Uh, J.L. Austin in the 1960s studied uh, the philosophy of language and he provided uh, dis distinguished representational language, uh, like uh, my glasses on the table, uh, from an other kinds of speech acts, as he called them. In particular, uh, acts that, or speech that performed an action in the speech. For example, the wedding vow I do, or the, the bet, uh, I bet the Caps are going to win tonight. Oh, I bet you 100 bucks the Caps are going to win tonight. I don't know, is that a good bet? We'll see. Uh, but uh, the, uh, those are both social actions, right? And Austin described these speech acts as performative. They perform an action through communication, through speaking. Right? And that's actually the origin of the word performative. Now the idea of performative uh, has become common in, 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 in parlance today, but actually its original frame is, is from this uh, uh, philosophy of language. So alternatively, we might think of the body as a performative action, that the information in the genome is not encoding uh, it, but is actually used as a set of resources in the performance of the self. And all you have to do is think a little bit about genetics and how uh, genes lead to uh, 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 consequences in the world, and you realize that enzymes are, uh, are molecules that catalyze reactions, that other kinds of hormones and paracrine signals are, are uh, and other molecular uh, uh, genetic uh, uh, um, 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 uh, elements are all active are, are all actions in the material world. In other words, it seems almost a slam dunk that the body is not a representation, that the genome is not a, a, a blueprint, but uh, performative in this way. So there isn't any area. Well, actually, the idea of language as performative, as as an action in the world and not just a representation, had a, a tremendous impact on the humanities in the 60s and 70s, leading to all post-structuralist and deconstruction and all these alternative theories, right, that the text is action, that the text is, it has, has consequences in the world and is not just a representation of it, right? Uh, and I, what I'm really proposing in the book is that this performative analogy have a similar kind of revolutionary impact on genetics and on the biomedicine and on evolutionary biology. Right. So um, how do I do that? Well, it turns out there isn't any place in academia or in the world where this idea of performativity or uh, the perf uh, 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 performative speech acts has been more uh, 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 analyzed in detail than queer theory. And queer theory is a body of philosophy and criti criticism that analyzes the conditions under which um, or the consequences of the existence of gender sex diversity and explaining it, explains its political consequences and understanding uh, uh, its relationship to power, uh, et cetera. And, and so um, uh, in diving into queer theory and my interest in studying, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 feminist uh, analysis of science, I uh, first started to get really get traction in reading one very famous worker, Judith Butler, on, uh, on gender theory and in her Gender Trouble, Bodies That Matter, a whole series of, of books uh, from the 90s on, uh, uh, on gender. Butler proposed that gender is a kind of performance, and a performance in two ways, uh, a, a performance of, uh, through a series of, um, of structured actions repeated over time, and also as performative, as a kind of expression that is a doing in the social world. Uh, that led to a very productive and very detailed theory of gender or gender as performance. And what I have been uh, proposed, what I proposed in the book, is extrapolating that uh, analysis and the intellectual tools from it down to the level of the uh, of molecular genetics, the physiology, development, and the evolution of bodies. Um, what's interesting and, and surprising to me, because in essence, I think. Um, to some readers, the content of the book will soon be obvious. Uh, I, I hope that <laughs> those readers are a lot of readers, but we'll see. But uh, uh, the, um, uh, it seems that there has not been anyone to actually engage with uh, developmental genetics and queer theory before, right? And so coming to this uh, kind of uh, sets of connections are really been fascinating. Well, what are those connections? Well. Um, 
um, performative theory of gender is organized around the idea of individual agency, right? The people are being the constitutive selves to this process. Uh, that um, that development is a discourse, uh, a, a kind of structured communicative interaction with the world, not just verbally, but uh, all sorts of cultural and and, uh, and individual signs. That that uh, performativity is deeply anti-essentialist. If you recognize that 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 discourse or structured communication uh, can create reality as well as describe it, then that undermines all essentialisms, any kind of prior uh, 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 et cetera. Um, and so in the book, what I analyze in detail, uh, I could have written it about feathers or flowers, but I just thought that uh, 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 genitalia were a lot more central uh, to, to the topic. And so the book includes a, a, a lot of description of the development and evolution of human sexual anatomy. Um, um, how did I get there? Well, uh, with a whole bunch of new reading uh, uh, and new engagement with research. But each time that I dove into that literature, I found greater and greater productivity uh, and, and engagement. Now, you can't write a book called Performance All the Way Down and have it be shallow. And so, uh, so uh, in some of these details, yeah, I, I mean, you have to go all the way down, right? Uh, and so what does that imply? That implies uh, 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 lots of molecular detail, lots of, uh, of, of cellular detail. And one of the things that, that, I, that I think was interesting about that was just trying to show the breadth of productivity of the idea of looking at the body in a performative way. But what I established, I think, is that um, sex is not a fact about the genome. It's not a fact about chromosomes. Sex is not a fact about hormones or levels of certain hormones, right? Um, sex is a becoming, a performance, a realization, an enactment by the self, right? And what that does is undermine all individual sexual binaries on a scientific basis, right? And so, um, what that also means is that, uh, is that differences in sexual development, uh, which are uh, now being recognized uh, as more and more common and giving rise to uh, lots of challenging and important uh, uh, questions in, 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 in biomedicine, are, are not evidence of the sexual binary gone wrong, but actually evidence that the individual sexual binary doesn't exist in the first place, that we are all pursuing uh, we are all making it up as we go along, right? And that that becoming, that individual becoming, leads us to much more differences and variations in outcomes uh, than, than science has recognized. Um, now, the stakes for biology are, are I think, tremendous. Um, uh, one of this, one of the important things is that this is a kind of opportunity for a reckoning between uh, science and biomedicine and the harms that the sexual binary has caused and continues to cause in the world. You know, um, since this is politics and prose, it's e easy to say that, that the, the, the idea and the concept of the sexual binary has become a prominent political issue. And many of those figures have been in the most uh, um, 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 uh, destructive ways, I think, have said trust the science, have claimed to trust the science, right? And what science and what's the role of science in actually asking to what science are they referring, and uh, and and how does science, how is science responsible for what it does? So this is a pathway for allowing that to happen, or allowing that reckoning. Uh, it's also a, a big pushback against experimental uh, genetics and the view of genes as individual causes uh, and essentialism a, a, in all genetic levels. And and I think from a scientific perspective, uh, that's going to lead to, uh, 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 I hope, some big changes. Um, the big goal there is to create or imply um, a, um, an explicitly queer space in the intellectual heart of evolutionary biology and genetics, right? And that that will lead to the opportunity for scientists as individuals to pursue uh, their, uh, their um, um, queer identities, their, uh, their, their, their political identities through their work. Now, uh, as Brad was kind enough to mention, you know, I started birdwatching at the age of 10. So uh, the work life 
uh, there's no separation, <laughs> you know, like the baseball ads say, you know, I live for this, you know, that's, that's exactly the way. That is what I've always experienced in my work, right? Um, I think that, you know, I feel that's a gift, right, for me, but I think there's a much broader way in which that could be true. And by creating um, um, a, a queer intellectual core in biology, that's an invitation to an entire new generation of creative individuals to come into the sciences and transform the sciences in, in what I think is an extraordinarily constructive way. So as I say, I think uh, evolutionary biology, developmental biology, genetics need queer theory in order to get the body right. Now the stakes for, for the culture are also huge. Um, uh, not only will a performative understanding of genetics give us an opportunity uh, to discuss uh, gender, sex, diversity in a common framework across genetics through culture, right? Uh, creating all sorts of new kind of conversations. We will also uh, lead to um, a pushback upon other forces that are really looking to use um, uh, traditional science in ways that I think uh, continues to harm people. And, and, and uh, I, I think one of the, the, the um, the biggest opportunities here is to see the relationship between science and culture uh, rearranged in a new way, where science isn't always dictating the terms of uh, the discussion, but actually looking to the humanities and uh, indeed to lived human diversity as a source of, of inspiration in the sciences. Right? Um, if sex is a becoming, uh, re uh, regardless of outcome, and we can also say that uh, there is n um, um, every individual becoming is a similarly uh, is, is similarly enacted, and this means that um, that there is no uh, a centralist identity uh, or 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 um, definition to be abandoned uh, through trans experience or to be adopted through trans experience, and there's nothing a centralist uh, to be uh, defended. Uh, through cis experience, and of course, these observations have lots of implications for the cultural discussion about gender, sex, diversity, um, and so um, um, performance all the way down is a way of capturing uh, this exciting new um, um, opportunity for bridge building between culture and science. Um, you know, all along the way, in the years that it took, and this is mostly a COVID-era project, um, um, I uh, thought, um, um, well, there are many ways at times when I've just been scared by my own, by the implications of my own work. Really? I'm a little frightened, right? And I figured, well, from my age and my stage of my career, if I'm frightened by my own work, then that's the right direction, right? So what I really am hoping is to recruit a new generation of scientists uh, and culture theorists and citizens uh, to help uh, uh, fulfill this possibility uh, through their own work. I don't want to dictate any of the details of how that's going to be. What does this future uh, biology look like? Uh, but I do, uh, I do hope to uh, get it kicked off. So with that, I'll I'd love to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. And, and if you have a question, uh, the microphone is available, and lots of folks would uh, let, prefer it if you use it. Hello, sir. Uh, the way I see it is that instead of moving from binary to diversity, we might be moving from binary to unary in the sense that artificial intelligence may take over um, in determining uh, the ideal man or, or uh, unary yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And, um, and that maybe all of this diversity is to distance um, sex and dating away from perpetuating the species to um, separating it from what artificial intelligence will eventually take over doing. Mm. Well, thank you for that. I, I'm, as an evolutionary biologist, I'm almost entirely a historian. 
uh, and haven't expended a lot of energy uh, on those future, uh, those futures, uh, possible futures, um, and um, and and so that's my, my I guess my response. Others. So what part of your uh, thinking about this, Rick, was the most difficult for you, uh, that you struggled the most with uh, before you sort of got it to a point where you were well, more comfortable with it? I, I, well, well there's a couple, there were a couple of big struggles. One was um, uh, I really wanted to write a short book, and it, it's no longer a short book. Actually, I wanted to write a book so short that you could steal it. Sorry about that. I don't. This is the wrong place to be talking about stealing books. But I wanted it. I wanted a book so small that you could steal it by slipping it into your back pocket, off of a table in a common room, uh, down the hall in your dorm, because you might not be willing to let others know that you were interested in it, right? Something that was providing um, uh, needed necessary information for uh, for for a, a, at a critical time, right? For someone, and and. But I found out that you cannot talk about sex efficiently, rapidly, and quickly. Uh, that the topic and trying to bring these fields together in a new way really requires a, a, a longer treatment. So getting used to the fact that it was going to be a, a full-size book, that, that was a challenge. Um, number two, um, a number of uh, reviewers repeatedly uh, asked me um, to talk about uh, race and sex and I was really reluctant I thought what can I possibly bring to that discussion that would be helpful that would not actually be uh, you know uh, a big problem and because I have no expertise in the area uh, and having been um, asked to read certain authors and engage with certain ideas, I suddenly realized, um, wait, I got something new to say. So there is, um, I think, really new contributions in this area I in the book. They're too complicated to dive into now, but in other words, I, I, the, the thing that I was most resistant to doing, that somebody required of me, I went in and I actually found out that I had new contributions to make and that was that was really rewarding hey thanks for uh thanks for the talk i'm asking you to argue against yourself a little bit here but i'm curious when you've talked with fellow people fellows in your field what the most compelling challenge you've you've confronted is or what skepticism you have maybe found most sure. convincing or had to really wrestle with well, so, um, uh, one of the one of the uh, the most frequent was, uh, uh, of course, I'm I, I'm finding from my own colleagues, um, uh, oh, I, I I really like all this stuff. Just get rid of the queer part, and uh, and I have to say, you know, this book isn't for us, you know, gray hairs, you know, it's for somebody else, right? Uh, but um, mostly the responses have been, yeah, but. And, and from a practicing scientist, how does it actually impact what you do in the lab or, or how you do your work? And by really looking at the body, the complicated body, as a hierarchy of agencies, cells, molecules, tissues, organs, all of whom have uh, some causal role rather than just the genes being the causes, uh, the strict causes and everything else being kind of downstream. Um, uh, what that requires is that research programs be organized at this level, that we give up on the idea of genes as somehow more fundamental, more important, more critical questions or, 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 or uh, areas to address in research. Um, and and um, there are areas of biology trying to do this. Uh, systems biology is, for those of you who are in, uh, uh, familiar, uh, is sort of in this area. Um, and yet systems biology itself is still kind of organized around uh, a lot of data, a lot of math, uh, and still trying to figure out what they are, right? And, uh, and, and this provides, I think, really strong action there. So um, uh, really what I'm hoping is that, you know, there are enough 
undergrads, grad students, postdocs, and all of these areas, they're going to read the book. Oh, I love this, and I'm going to realize it in, in my work. Uh, and uh, of course, there'll be some pluralism for a while. You, I'm not going to overcome the individual sexual binary in science immediately, but I think that we uh, we can have a, 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 a kind of ongoing competition who uh, and see. Uh, whether this turns out to be uh, scientifically productive, which I think it will, and, 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 and uh, uh, politically productive, uh, and, and then I think it will, it will move forward. Thank you. Hello. Um, Hello. Thank you for the, the talk. Um, so I was curious, one of my uh, uh, thinker that I really like is Alok Bade Menon. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Yeah. Um, yeah. They do a lot of work with like queer theory and art and all of these things. Um, and they recently came out with a book called Beyond the Gender Binary, which is geared towards like elementary school students. And they're like, uh, like deep in the work, but has tried to kind of make it this like short book, as you were kind of describing, that you can like put in your pocket. Um, I'm curious, like, if you think this kind of work, it's possible even to boil that down into like a children's level, or like if you think that's really not the goal of this work, as you said, this is kind of like currently geared towards graduates, post-grads, um, yeah. Yeah, well, the, the book, uh, I, I tried to write a book that would be available to all, you know, dedicated readers, but that really means, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in sort of college engaged, level of engagement, high school, uh, serious high school. A, a, if you don't know what DNA is, you'll find it described in this book. and. Uh, and for those who have never heard of uh, Karen Barat or Judith Butler, you'll see, learn about their work in the book. So it has everything you need, right? Uh, but clearly it's written at that level. How could I take that down to even elementary level? Um, I haven't faced that challenge yet, but I, I, I think that most, most of these things are very obvious to children. I remember my own... Um, going to a, a wedding uh, of uh, one of my college roommates with my children. And my oldest was like, um, oh, and no, he's actually way before the wedding. He's even younger. And, and, and describing at six, you know, who were those guys at this family party? And I described them. And he, he said, oh, you mean they're a man-man family? And he was six, and and it was like, okay, they're ready to understand the world based on the the uh, um, uh, embodied people, you know, the people that they meet, and 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 if they're if those people uh, are allowed to be themselves, then they'll see more of those examples, and this will be this will become more obvious. Um, um, uh, but I'll I'll. I'll, I'll, I'll take that in consideration and think of that as an extra challenge. I wanted to write a, 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 a children's book, or had the idea to write a children's book once, uh, 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 and I talked to my agent, and, and, and he said, I have lots of experience with scientists wanting to write children's books, and all of them are bad. <laughs> but I still think that one about T-Rex is a good dad. I definitely, I'm definitely going to try that someday, but thank, thank you. you. Others. Professor Crum, hey. um, is there an assumption that you had before you started writing the book, or maybe when you were in the early stages of writing it, that you were most surprised as yeah. you got further along to find yourself questioning and just, uh, if you could talk about just what that emotional experience might have been like yeah. of, of well, questioning it, things? Yeah, absolutely, and I think it's one of the most fundamental conclusions of the book. I started writing this book without any personal question of the individual sexual binary. That was not my mission. My mission was to create a language that we could talk across disciplines. And yet I found through my engagement with the science and my engagement with the theory uh, that I was wrong. That I had to change that. And, um, and that was a profound discovery. Uh, like I say, you know, some of these moments were, were scary. And, you know, and you 
um, um, and I think uh, ultimately extremely rewarding. So, so another question. I mean, you, you spoke about how your work with birds and particularly aggressive ducks, you know, led to your interest in feminist science theory and then this book. So how now, working back or the other way, do you think your work on this book is going to influence your work on birds? Yeah, it already has. And, 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 and um, I haven't actually figured out all the details of um, what is an appropriate what will be the appropriate way to talk about male and female in, 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 in science, in, in, in other species, in wild species. Um, and I think often um, we'll, 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 we'll continue to do that, um, um, maybe with a set of new, newly fashioned air quotes around, you know what I mean, but I, obviously that's not a long-term solution. Um, we're still doing a mathematical genetic theory on aspects of duck sex and bowerbirds and other sorts of things. And I think what, what's really uh, uh, needed here as well is um, new theory that takes into account the agency of things between the level of the whole organism interacting with the environment uh, in a niche. Uh, reproducing and surviving, uh, and the genome, that is, the cells and organs and, 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 and mo molecules of the body, um, uh, that all those levels matter, and uh, whether it's in terms of achieving uh, success, having a fully well-integrated functioning body, or um, biomedicine disease, how we, how we uh, misperform ourselves, which I have a discussion of in the book. Um, and uh, so I think there'll be lots of benefits to it, but, uh, but clearly my expertise is in birds. And so uh, uh, we're doing now single cell transcriptomics on feathers, so we're plucking developing feathers and looking at all the genes that are being expressed in all the cells of the growing feather and trying to understand how they interact. Uh, and that's a system, right? Not just at the level of genes, but at the level of cells and tissues and their interactions that, that create outcomes. And so that, that's already touched you know, influencing the way I think about the body. Well, thank you very much. Real pleasure to be here, and thank you again, Alyssa and uh, and Brad for uh, uh, for uh, for for the invitation. Thanks.